Yes, please. Thank you, Ray. All right, um, folks on Zoom, are you able to see the uh, the screen I'm sharing? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Oh, you can leave those open, Ray. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's see if I can get this uh, microphone adjusted. I want to try to make sure that we, uh, we help our folks who are participating on Zoom by providing the best sound we can. It's a little tricky. All right, so we're able to see the screen on Zoom and you guys can hear me? Okay. So I'm going to welcome everybody to our May 12th monthly meeting for the North Texas Archaeological Society. My name is Jimmy Barrera. I'm the president of the society. And uh, we've got some announcements. Let me get my screen advancing here. Oh, it is advancing. I'm sorry. Okay. Oops. I messed that up a little bit. Okay, so some of our general announcements, you know, we had um, at least one NTAS event since our previous monthly meeting, and that was the Baku Artifact Analysis Workshop that, that Dr. Katrina Whitley hosted. So um, I appreciate everybody who participated. I hope you had the opportunity to, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Whitley hosting the workshops that she has been over the last month plus or so. Um, um, important note for everybody, that in June, NTAS does not have a monthly meeting and we do not produce a newsletter. So, so don't you know, expect a meeting in June, don't expect a newsletter, that's, that's standard. Uh, we resume meetings and the newsletter in July. Uh, and then in July, Tim Roberts with Tech Sparks and Wildlife will be our guest speaker. So he's gonna take us out to the desert at Waco Tanks and, uh, and talk about the archaeology and rock art and um, probably hard to find anybody more familiar with the uh, rock art and archaeology of Waco tanks. And so I'm pretty excited about that to host Tim Roberts in July. And if you, if you haven't found the hats and what I'm calling the business card ruler that we have uh, here, uh, we're requesting donations. Uh, we're requesting a $15 donation for the hat and a $1 donation for the business card ruler. Uh, those are uh, essentially my gift, my give back to the membership. I designed those and I bought those for the membership. So all of the donations will go to our scholarship fund <coughs> and our general fund. Um, and also I wanna make sure that folks are aware of the, uh, the, the Lloyd Irwin Memorial Silent Auction that we're having for uh, Lloyd's hand carved shovel. So please uh, take a look at uh, the hand carved shovel out there and uh, make a bid. And then at the end of tonight's meeting, the, the highest bidder wins. And uh, we, we appreciate those, those donations. That'll also go toward the NTAS Memorial Scholarship Fund. Welcome to our new members since the last meeting. Uh, we have a a few new members who have joined and uh, our, our newest member, I saw Melody Nichols is here with us. So, so welcome to our, our new members. And uh, at this point we have almost 230 members and that's a, that's a big deal. So uh, at this time last year, we had around 165 members. So uh, NTAS is, is growing and uh, and, and based on all the information available uh, to me, we are the largest regional archeological society in the state at this point. I also wanna welcome our, our special guests who are uh, joining us 
via Zoom, and there may be some here from the Caddo Nation. So we have uh, members of the Caddo Nation who are uh, participating in, in this month's meeting, and I want to welcome uh, our, our special guest from the Caddo Nation. So thank you for participating. And welcome. Uh, our free memberships. So we have uh, we've issued a few of those this year. We have plenty more available for students. So if you know a student, um, spread the word. We have free memberships. All you have to do is apply for it. And then scholarships. So we also offer scholarships for Texas Archaeological Society events, including the upcoming field school, which will be next month, and the annual meeting, which will be in October. We have already awarded four scholarships for the field school, and we're ready to award more. So spread the word and apply. And speaking of the field school, um, I wanted to do a little bit of a, uh, an intro on the Texas Archaeological Society Field School. It'll be in Kerrville next month. So if you're not familiar, it will be in the, the same place that it was last year. June 11th to the 18th. Registration is open. Uh, what you're looking at here, photo on the upper left, that is the, uh, the camp area and the main pavilion. That's where registration goes on and there's free camping. So if you participate in the TAS field school, you can camp for free. And all of the activity areas, meals, the main pavilion where they have all of the programs, they sell all the TAS gear, all of that is here on the Guadalupe River in Kerrville, so you have river access too. Uh, and then on the lower right is the main archaeological site where the investigations are ongoing. And, uh, and that's also on the Guadalupe River, uh, right around Kerrville. And then this on the lower left is the 2022 t-shirt design for TAS Field School. And uh, the TAS Field School Chair, Tiffany Osborne, designed that. She also provided these slides. Uh, and I know this is a lot of information, so I won't necessarily walk through this all, but this is essentially the agenda for the evening programs or, you know, some programs each day that aren't related to the field work. So you have kind of a, a ballpark schedule uh, start starting in the morning and then you go do, you know, survey excavation or lab work or, or whatever. Uh, and then there's a series of evening programs, including guest speakers some nights, some nights they're social, some nights they have uh, Archeo Olympics and kids events, and, uh, and they have public forums and artifact identification. And so there's a lot of activities tied into field school that aren't just, you know, working out and doing excavations. So it's a, it's a good time. So last year there were about 350 people that participated in the TAS field school, uh, many of them from uh, tribal nations and uh, many from the North Texas Archaeological Society. So uh, if you're not going and you have interest, I would look into it. Um, a little plug about Texas Archaeology Month. So Maggie Moore with the Texas Historical Commission has asked the North Texas Archaeological Society to, uh, to solicit volunteers to help build kits. And these are for kids. These are for school age kids to to help them learn. So it's kind of a STEM activity to learn about archeology span hands-on. And, um, and, and the idea would be that these kits would be available in October, which is Texas Archaeology Month. So if we start helping build these kits now, then they would have <coughs> plenty of kits available by October to provide to you know, universities, schools, archeological societies, or, or whoever may have a, a Texas Archaeology Month event. Um, so if you have interest to, to help build these TAM kits, please contact Maggie Moore. Uh, and Maggie also provided uh, an interesting field opportunity at a plantation near Marshall, Texas. And Marshall is East Texas. So it's, you know, it's fairly due east to here, but right over near the Louisiana border. And, uh, and this would be an opportunity to, as I understand it, mostly do survey uh, to kind of help uh, delineate either the site or some areas of the site, but it should be fairly interesting. And so if you want to participate in a, a plantation delineation, contact Mike and work. Um, Chris Mice has additional field work at the Clovis Field site. That's Mills County. 
And many folks have participated in that, but if you haven't, it's about two, two and a half hours south or southwest of here. Uh, it's a really neat site that uh, Chris, Mice, Chris Mice and the landowner, Del Barnett, are coordinating and working with the Galt School of Archaeological Research to, uh, to, to continue to pursue the, the excavations. And I think there may be some survey and lab work going on now, too. If interested, contact Chris Mice. Um, Ms. Jen, uh, Ms. Jen Fricks here has uh, a couple of items. So the Archaeology Kids Camp in June, we're, we're looking for volunteers to help with this. And this will be in Parker County, here just west of, of uh, Fort Worth and in, in Weatherford at the DOS uh, Center, DOS Museum in Heritage Weatherford. Culture. The DOS Heritage Culture uh, Center. Center. There we go. And it's, it's the Archaeology Kids Camp, so NTAS has, has assisted with that uh, at least the last couple of years or so. It's a, it's a great event. So if interested, please contact Jen. Um, also, the, the North Texas Archaeological Society Executive Committee voted to dissolve the library. I know we've got so many brand new members, and honestly, including myself, I wasn't very familiar with the North Texas Archaeological Society library, but, but it is... Uh, a library that Ms. Jen has hosted for quite a long time, and a lot of the older members provided donations to uh, to build that library, but we, we voted to dissolve it, uh, and we're asking the original donors to either contact Jen to retrieve the, the books they originally donated, or eventually we'll, we'll turn it into a fundraiser and, and offer those for donation to the membership at some point here later this year, I believe. Uh, and with that, Dr. Katrina Whitley wanted to, uh, to say a few words. Uh, Dr. Whitley, if you're here, I can't see you on Zoom because I'm kind of standing back from it. But are you able to talk about the, uh, the Baku site? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to uh, invite you guys. This is an uh, in-test event. Um, and the Baku Archaeological Site has been excavated. This will be our 13th season that we've been out at the site. The site is located in Arroyo Seco, New Mexico, which is just north of Taos, New Mexico. Um, the site dates between 1050 and 1250 AD. Um, and excitingly, it really has done a, a lot of shifting and changes to the archaeology in the area, as well as um, all of us that have been out there have really been able to open up archaeology to avocational because this is something that really wasn't an accepted thing in New Mexico. So it's been a really great site in that manner. Um, we do only have a limited number of spaces um, to bring on some extra people to come out and excavate with us. Um, so if you would be interested, please do contact me. Um, it is in the main newsletter for, for the details on how to contact me. Um, it is, I do have to say, it is not a field school, so we really are looking for folks who do have some excavation experience, but if you think you don't really have a lot, but you're very interested, please do go ahead and contact me, and we can have a talk about it. Um, we stay in the uh, Rio Hondo condos up in the Taos Key Valley, um, and it's a great time. You can volunteer for either one week or both weeks, um, and it is all volunteer paid, so we do not have any kind of funds for anyone to go. So if you do go, you are responsible for your own transportation, room and board, um, food, things like that. But we do all share condos up at the Taos Key Valley. So it really is a great time. Um, and please do contact me if it's something you would be interested in. All right, thank you, Dr. Whitley. Um, with that, our guest speaker and I will finally leave the stage and quit bothering everybody, Dr. Leslie Bush. Uh, Dr. Bush, I'm going to switch out everything. So right here, there's your pointer. I'm going to leave that here, picking up all your audio. And then let me switch your slides right quick. Okay, we're going to see that. 
Let me start sharing for folks on Zoom. Just a moment here. Okay, on Zoom, can we see that slide now? Um, and then Dr. Bush, can you advance it with the? Yes, I can. There we go. Yay. Okay. Great. Am I in the frame properly? Or does it matter? I think you're I think you're in it standing there. Perfect. Okay, thank you. I am happy to be here tonight. Thank you for inviting me up from, from Austin and Menchaca uh, to talk about, about um, Caddo houses in East Texas. And by, by houses, I mean um, what Carolyn Spock calls uh, domiciles, just regular residences where people live with their families. Uh, what I'm going to give tonight is, is a general kind of bird's eye overview that's based mostly on other people's work, uh, but also incorporates. Yes, sir. Are you using the mic? I am not. It is on the table. Um, okay. Do I need to do I need to pin it to my yeah, shirt? Yeah. I shall so, pin. Okay, great. Excuse excuse the noises while I attach this to my person <laughs> here. I have to switch it on. I think I may have switched. Oh it. well, that would be. It's right on the top of the box. It'll switch right on the top. And twisty switch you or just pokey flick it, switch? Flick it to the one side or the other. You'll see a little green light come in. There it is. Now it's on. Ooh. Now it's on. All right. So let's back this up. Oh. I'm still happy to be here. I'm happy to have better audio. Uh, again, talking about Caddo houses in East Texas, by houses, I mean, I'm using Carolyn Spock's um, term, I'm substituting that for Carolyn Spock's term, domiciles, just regular residences where, where people live with their families. It's going to be a, a bird's eye overview of mostly other people's work, but with a little bit of my experience under the microscope looking at plants from Caddo archaeological sites with, with special attention to the construction materials for these houses. And also a little bit from my participation, my brief participation in the 2016 construction of a Caddo grass house, this Caddo grass house at Caddo Mounds that was led by Caddo elder Phil Cross. Uh, the Caddo tradition of building grass houses died out sometime between 1855 and the early 1890s, uh, but Wichita's continued to build them and uh, their, their tribal seal has a grass house on it. The Caddo tribal seal has the has dancers and the, and the dance ground there in, in, in what I interpret as the dance ground there in blue and we'll get back to that later. Um, Wichita's continue to build the grass houses. Uh, they are Caddoan speakers like, like Caddo's and Pawnee's and Arikara and Wichita's were one of several tribes who contributed examples of their traditional architecture for the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. You see a postcard on top, uh, two images, same image twice, uh, of the, the house frame there. And you'll notice a little bit, uh, some differences from the Caddo houses that I know of, um, it, but it has that, that in, an interior frame with four support posts, uh, which, which I think we see archaeologically. And the horizontal rings around it, the, what the, the laughing or the, the horizontal supports for the thatching are, are fairly close together in this image. So that's something to look at. And down in the bottom right, you see the finished house from the 1904 World's Fair. And another thing to notice is the, uh, the design, the almost woven design there of, of the thatching. The earliest written accounts of Caddo houses uh, come from, or of Caddo grass architecture, I guess, come from the French writers who were part of LaSalle's ill-fated expedition to find the mouth of the Mississippi. Um, and they describe, thank you. They describe, um, they describe how the house is built, where it starts with long poles, placed in a circle, placed, placed in post molds that are dug, set up in a circle, tied together at the top by two 
strong young men who stand on a sort of ladder in the middle. Uh, it's it's a, a post really with the branches of, of a little bit of the tree branches still on the side so that it functions as a ladder. And they stand on the top of it, <coughs> 15, 20, even up to 40 or 50 feet in the air, gather all the ends of those poles, lasso them together and secure them to make this frame. And after that, the horizontal lathing is put on, uh, the horizontal supports for the thatching, and then the house is thatched from the bottom to the top. Uh, the, the Spanish chroniclers who described pretty much what the French do as well uh, are very clear to mention almost every time that the, that the thatching starts at the bottom and goes to the top because it's the opposite of how thatching was done, uh, was done in Spain at the time. And they, they also mentioned decorations that are woven into, woven into the thatching. So. And so oh, here we have another photo. Here's, here's the thatching starting at the bottom and you can see lapping on the outside and they're gonna head up. These are very tall switch grasses that we had access to um, in 2016. And thatching goes all the way to the top and there is no smoke hole left for, for the fire. It smoke simply gathers in the, top of the, in the top of these very tall houses and sort of wafts out, which provides some protection um, against insects and against mold in, in the thatch up at the top. Um, you can see some of the thatching here is green. In 2016, not enough thatch had been cut not quite enough thatch had been cut to completely cover the house. So they had to go back and harvest um, and harvest fresh switchgrass in, in the middle of the construction. That's not optimal because of course the grass dries as on the house and it shrinks. And so you do have to go back and, um, and it, it leaves a little more spaces that are optimal. And let's see, do I have an interior? Oh yes, here's, here's the, um, I'm gonna say there's no, I want to go back to the fact that there is there is a hearth at in the usually in the center of these houses and again that varies some houses may not have hearths it's hard to tell if these are shallow deposits where that have often been plowed so sometimes if you don't see a hearth it's hard to know if it's because the house hearth was plowed out or if there simply never was a hearth but the pole that the two young men were standing on <coughs> at the beginning of the house leaves leaves a little a little divot in the center of the house, which is a perfect, perfect place um, to, to make a puddled, puddled hearth. And that does seem to be what, what often happened. And uh, the French and Spanish accounts, again, are, are pretty clear that there is no smoke hole. Uh, there is, however, this 1852 depiction um, with the historical authenticity maybe in doubt. And Tom Middlebrook excavated a Caddo breast house where it did have a circular clay deposit in the center, but he interpreted that based on the archaeology and the patterning of, 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 of the stratigraphy uh, as remains of a daub that had lined a roof hole, as, as you would see in these pictures. So that is a possibility at some places and times. Grass houses are a thousand year tradition for Caddo people. So it would be shocking really <coughs> if, there, if there weren't some variation over time and space. And these, and these uh, fire holes may have been one variant. Um, yeah, the French weren't around in Caddo, in the Caddo homeland really long enough um, to understand Caddo grass houses as a social process as well as an engineering process that, that they so nicely describe. But Espinosa, the later, later Spanish writer who visited the Caddo homeland in East Texas several times in the early 1700s, he does describe the social process of, of house construction. And the process starts with the perspective householders approaching the caddy, the local political leader, to get permission. We need permission from the political leadership to create a new house um, and also to, to decide how big a house should you have and when can we build this house. And once those things are established, uh, they calculate the number of poles that will be needed for the house and cut small sticks, the same number of sticks as there are going to be poles in the house. And this to me is, is, is really lovely because the number of posts in a house are something that appears directly in the archaeological record. So we know for every house a caddy cut 
or had kept probably um, that number of sticks to be distributed by his by the caddy's men to each household that was going to participate in the construction of this house. And so the, the caddies men send out, you receive a stick at your household, and your household is responsible for providing however many sticks you got, because some, some households get more than one, however many sticks, plus all the, the brass for thatching that will be necessary to cover that portion of a house and presumably the ties, they don't mention this, but presumably the lashing of the, the ties, and also the labor for that portion of the house. And so on the appointed day, the, the house supervisors and the chief supervisor have, uh, the evening before, they have all the, post, all the post holes dug, everything's ready. And at dawn, the chief supervisor gives the signal and the young men come running with the poles, set their poles on the ground, and then two guys scramble up to the top, um, lash it all together. Then they start the willow laughing. Then they start thatching. Uh, usually the women, the women are in charge of the grass for thatching. The men are in charge of getting the poles. And they, so they start the thatching and the whole thing is done by a little after midday, whatever time that might be. I don't know many hours, oh yes. Don't know many, how many hours that's gonna be, depends on time of year, um, but that's all it takes. And at that point, the householders who have not been not been uh, working on the house, you, you in general, you don't build your own house. It is a gift from the community. So the, the householders have been off preparing a feast. And at that point, the feast is served and everyone eats a lot and, and goes home happy and full. Oh, these are the pine poles from the 2016 pine pole harvest. Uh, the poles for the... This house was lost in, in the Shaho, in the tornado um, about three years ago. And there are plans afoot, as, as I think Jimmy mentioned in the meeting announcement tonight, um, well afoot. The, the materials have been gathered and the trees have been marked. Uh, the trees for poles have been marked for a July 2022 build of another, of another house at, at Catamounts. And the poles, however, won't. everything else, I believe, the willow has been harvested and is waiting in water. The switchgrass has been harvested, uh, but the, and the poles have been marked, but they won't be gathered until just before, until just before they're set in the ground because they have to be very bendy and bendy and green at that point. Oh, and here's the switchgrass. There were four switchgrass harvests I participated in one this year. And the interior work on the house happens after after the, but it is done by the family and it happens after the big house building event. And it includes installing bed platforms around the walls. Uh, the beds are made from mats, uh, probably from river cane, and they're supported on forked poles, a little bit like a, a, a lot like a camp cot. And additional mats, these large colorful ones like this one, are bent into sort of alcoves that frame each individual bed in the house. And the French remarked on, on how beautiful they were and how nice it was to have your own individual space. Um, and above the living area is the storage space where the wood and the cane shelving um, hold large baskets of cane and bark um, that, that hold the shell, shelled corn, beans, nuts, um, other foodstuffs and also mortars and pestles for grinding in, inside during bad weather. Uh, I think the bulk of the crops are probably housed outside the house in, in a separate granary. And the chiefs needed even more storage space to hold the very large pots that they needed to have to be able to provide feasts commensurate with, with their status. And seeds, seeds that were saved for planting are probably in the house, I think, probably in the ceramic seed pots that are known archeologically. Some houses, according to the French, house one family, others may house up to eight or 10. And the houses um, of, of leaders are larger, they have more poles, um, and so more families contribute to the effort and they're fed more abundantly afterwards. Houses also aren't distributed randomly on the landscape, but they cluster with other structures and they cluster with features of the natural landscape. This is the, the famous Turan map uh, that shows compounds of one to three houses associated with granaries and ramadas. Um, and they're strung out along several kilometers of the Red River. Uh, you can see also a temple mound on the far left center. 
and, and other special buildings. Uh, Jutel, Henri Jutel, who was on the, on the Neches, also describes an expansive village with houses clustered in hamlets and fields, but uh, between the clusters of houses. And Cassanius mentions people planting uh, a small plot in front of the Grand Sinesi's house, in front of the house of the spiritual leader, uh, who would not need to plant his own garden, but they, it was planted for him, quote, so that he might have something green to enjoy. Hmm. When archaeologists have examined the remains of Caddo buildings, it's been through excavation and remote sensing, uh, like magnetometry, both of which are very good at showing the floor plans of buildings. So we've tended to think about buildings in terms of their shape, um, dividing them essentially into round and square or rectangular. And we've also classified buildings as burned or unburned and domicile regular house or special purpose have turned out to be fairly useful categories for the kinds of questions that archaeology is suited to addressing. Um, most of the buildings at Caddo Mounds, Caddo, this is from Caddo Mounds, you're looking at Mount, Mount A, that's Highway 21 running across the top of the picture. Most of, the, most of the occupation at Caddo Mounds dates 81,000 to 1,200, and most of the buildings there are circular rather than square or rectangular, though you do see one down in the bottom right. Um, Carolyn Spock looked at the structures excavated here through the mid-70s and found that 36 of 50 uh, were circular. And even the structures that aren't circular are kind of sub-round or square with rounded corners kind of buildings, so uh, just a lot of round structures going on. Clay Schultz at the, at the same site uh, compiled the results of magnetometry imaging that was done in this century. Um, on 66 buildings, he found that 60 of them were circular. Um, so in general, the houses at Caddo Mounds and, and elsewhere in East Texas are about seven to 12 meters across, um, but they range from less than three meters to more than 20. There is a circular structure on a mound at the Werner site in Northwest Louisiana that was more than 28 meters in diameter, that's 92 feet. It's not clear if that was a roofed structure or, or an enclosure, uh, some kind of fenced enclosure to define the sacred space of that on that mound top. So, uh, but back to East Texas. Uh, Oak Hill Village in Rusk County picks up chronologically where Caddo Mounds leaves off at AD 1250 to 1450. And it also has, well, as you see, mostly circular buildings there, maybe one square, a couple squares in the middle. Um, Pine Tree Mound comes chronologically late 14th century, uh, all the way up to 1650 or so. And again, the houses here at this later site are mostly circular. Uh, Mary Beth Trubit in Arkansas also found that circular structures were the norm there from the 1100s to the 1600s. Um, but circles are generally more common south of the Sabine, basically in Texas, uh, than they are elsewhere in the Caddo world. There is a lot of variation, as, as one would expect for such a long tradition over so much space. Um, but there does seem to be a tendency for the circular buildings to be regular domiciles and the square ones to be more special purpose. And the trend is stronger outside Texas, because almost everything is circles, is circles here. Um, uh, Daniel Rogers in 1982 looked at special purpose structures up in the northern Caddo region, north of the Arkansas River, uh, and describes them as um, mostly square. The special purpose structures are mostly square up there. And early noted changes in architecture at the Standridge site in architecture as, as the site transitioned from primarily a residential site to primarily a special purposes, special activity site, the architecture switches from round to square. Interestingly, in Arkansas, east of the Caddo homeland, and really much of the middle Mississippian world in general, the, the opposite is true. It's the, the special structures, special purpose structures are more likely to be circular and the regular <coughs> houses um, are square. And of that research is done by a, a man named John House. So often an enthusiast, uh, pay attention. Uh, this is Angel Mounds at the other northeastern end of the Mississippian world, kind of opposite from, from Caddo. You have the palisade is running across the upper right. It's a very palisade wall, very really substantial palisade wall here on the, running across the upper right. If square, regular domiciles, regular residential buildings are aligned, are aligned with that palisade wall. On the upper left, you can see about half of a circular structure that is interpreted as a sweat lodge based on a, a large amount of charcoal and ash that was deposited just north of that structure. So, so the opposite of what's going on, uh, going on in the Caddo world in terms of, of their relationship to circles and squares. Uh, but what does make a special purpose 
structure. Um, for archaeologists, it's one that is unusually large or small. It's in an unusual location, like on top of a mound, uh, or it has an unusual floor plan, like this building here that has been called the maze at, at catamounts because of its, its extremely complex floor plan. Uh, or, or special purpose structures can sometimes be just circles, but they have distinctive features like, like a long entryway out, out in front of them. Early explorers and missionaries did describe special purpose structures like, like the temples and, and the houses of political and religious leaders. Um, and and Jutel tells, uh, Henri Jutel uh, describes an assembly house that was constructed specifically to house a war party for them to gather in, and then it was burned down as soon as they left. So a very brief occupation uh, of that structure. Oh, ramadas and granaries or other special purpose structures um, and drying racks. And you see here uh, the Long Hat uh, family on what I believe is a, is a drying rack, um, possibly a corn grinding booth as well. Uh, and the dance ground and the arbor, we're coming back to the Caddo Seal, the dance ground and the arbor are also special purpose structures. And uh, Vanola Nukumet uh, describes them as they are the Caddo architectural traditions with ancient roots that have survived to the present day. Um, they're not readily recognizable archeologically. We can sometimes recognize a plaza that may have been a dance ground by, thing, by the lack of architecture, assuming that that lack of architecture has been consistent over time. Uh, recognizing an arb a dance arbor uh, from posts on the ground is a lot more difficult, especially if the pattern's obscured uh, with earlier or later posts in the area. Um, Vanilla Nukumit says that willow uh, is used for the, for the upper part of the dance arbors and they're on oak support posts. Uh, special structures excavated from mounds were often partially disassembled, um, then burned and then buried, um, probably in conjunction with the death of the, of the political leader associated with that structure. Uh, as, as Tim Hurdle says, you don't build a mound to build a mound. You get a mound when you have a building that needs to be buried. Uh, the association of fire with these important buildings underscores the importance of fire and smoke as, as cleansing agents, um, traditional properties that Western science of support you know, cleansing by cauterization, um, by heating, and by the antimicrobial, antimicrobial properties of, of wood smoke. Um, and again, special structures are more likely to be burned than for the regular domiciles. And at Caddo Mounds, three of the special purpose structures uh, excavated were burned, but none of the 30 excavated um, domiciles were, were noted as burned. I don't interpret the magnetometry data as suggesting a greater burn rate for those houses, and I'm happy to, to discuss that with anybody who wants. Um, and large-scale excavations of domestic areas at Oak Hill and at Pine Tree Mounds also don't show, um, show few to know burn structures at those locations. And so the fire brings us finally um, to the archeological remains of construction material for the houses. Um, wooden posts and grass thatching don't typically survive in the soil, they become compost, um, but they do, they do become uh, the stains in the soil that allow us to see some of these houses. You're looking at uh, a house from the pine tree on the side. You can see that the post molds have been thoughtfully marked in pink. You can see the circle in pink marked in pink tape, and then there's a partial, another partial circle mount marked in red tape. So the, the decay of plant material is helpful in delineating the architecture. It's not so helpful in figuring out what um, what that architecture was made of. But when things are burned, when plants are burned in the fire, that does survive or can survive in the soil if we're very lucky and, and allows us to say something. Um, and most preservation of plant material in the cattle world is, is through fire. Uh, maybe, the mo oh, maybe the most striking thing uh, about the archeology span of the domestic houses that have burned, burned down is how very few of them there are, uh, which, is at once um, frustrating that I don't have a wealth of data from burned houses to know what, what the variation was, what, what these things were, were made of typically and what's, what's typical, what's atypical and what, what the changes are, are through time. But it does provide information about um, a persistent culture of 
fire wisdom in, in ancient and probably modern Caddo culture. So even though fire was ubiquitous, um, fires must have been carefully tended to keep the sparks down um, and flare ups must have been quickly extinguished. There's one, one Spanish account where the Spaniards get into big trouble because they stir up the flames um, in an indoor fire. And appreciation for the cleansing power of fire and smoke um, is apparent in its use to decommission the special buildings on mounds, uh, but the destructive properties of fire were also apparently um, appreciated and, and well controlled. So, so for archaeobotanists in East Texas, the control of fire means that, um, well, uh, any guesses as to what my sample size on the number of burned houses is that I was able to find? Yeah? Jen? Five? Less than five. These are ones where the oh, where the wood's been identified. I'm they're probably ones where the wood's been collected, but it has to be recently enough that somebody cared to identify it. We're gonna it's less than three. <laughs> <laughs> it is one. And this is a, yes, this is the one house that I could find in the literature uh, where the house burned down, and you can see the upper picture is a an arc of some of those posts, and you can see every post has, has been burned. Um, it's possible that some of single burner posts were part of houses, were, were just a part of a house burned, and somebody got yelled at, but the house didn't, didn't go down. Um, so what was this made of? All the posts that I was able to examine were red green book. So, um, and oh, this is the Overlook. This is called Overlook House at Pine Tree Mound. It was excavated by Eloise Gaddis and, and Ross Fields and company um, and published in 2012. This is Oak of the Red Group. You see the, the inside on the lower left is a transverse section of, at the end grain of, of wood charcoal, the, this red group oak. And then you see on the right examples of those leaves, the, uh, the red group oaks have those whiskers um, at, the, at the points of their leaves. So that's it. Uh, and oh, the species, the particular species of oak, you're looking at Quercus marlandica there. Um, other possibilities in East Texas are uh, Quercus falcata and Quercus shumardii. Um, we do have a few individual burn posts that were associated, may have been associated with houses, may have been single posts that burned. Um, there's a red group oak center cow post from Coyote House at Pine Tree Mound, um, and an oak of some kind at the Foggy Fork site in Nacogdoches County. Oh, these are the individual, those are ones that are associated with, with houses, sorry about that. And they're both red group, uh, red group or regular oak uh, or some kind of oak. The individual posts, we've got two red group oaks from two different farmsteads in Titus County, five oaks and a hickory from four sites near, near Lake Nakanichi, and two red group oaks and another hickory, each from a different Caddo farmstead in Titus County. Those are the bird posts. There are not many. Uh, Oak and hickory are the, are the common trees of the piney woods um, and the post oak savanna where, where caddos made their homes in East Texas. It's a little surprising that pine is represented given that it's, it's, the, it's a co-dominant with oak and hickory in those upland forests. Um, but pine was used in a rectangular house at the winding stair site in Arkansas. Um, and, it, and it's what was used for the 2016 and will be used for the 2022 house at, at, Pine, at, um, at Caddo Mounts. So, so it, it, seems, it seems very appropriate. Um, it's, I think it's just our sample size. It's not picking it up. Um, I have seen willow poles, which willows are, the, are what we used in 16 and 22 for the laughing, the patch supports around the houses. And I've seen willow poles mentioned as, as the tall poles for uh, Wichita grass houses. Um, woods like Bodark and Red Cedar would, uh, would be more rot resistant than, um, than pine or, or oak, um, but Bodarks don't produce those beautiful tall straight poles that you see uh, that, that are necessary for cattle houses. Uh, and Wichita's did sometimes use Red Cedar. I don't know if, if Caddo's would have. Um, as for the thatching material, switchgrass, um, is what again what was used in 16 and 20, 2016 and 22. Espinoza describes the grass used for thatching as coarser than the coarsest wheat, and that's wheat and where wheat he's coming from a European tradition where wheat straw is, is a common thatching material. Um, Parker says that 19th century grass houses are covered with um, prairie grasses, so cert certainly switchgrass is a prairie grass. Your other your op other options. Um, 
for some of these tall prairie grasses that would have been appropriate are big blue stem, little blue stem, um, Indian grass, um, possibly Eastern gamma grass, but that's getting pretty coarse. Uh, the Wichita tribal page mention, mentions those grasses. And wetland grasses are also possible for thatching, uh, for thatching caddo houses, like uh, this common reed, which is from the, uh, the arboretum in, in Nacogdoches. And Wichita's also are historically sometimes used rice grass um, or rushes, which are grass, grass like plants that grow in wetlands. The 1981 grass house was thatched with, with this with common reed phragmites. The oh, 1981 grass house is one that uh, Scooter Cheatham built as an exercise in experimental archaeology, making it with making it with stone tools, weighing all his materials and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the, the interest, one of the interesting things about the common reed is that it's native to both North America and Europe. And in Europe, it's considered a very high quality thatching material. So that is a possibility. Uh, I want to do, a, do I have time for a quick sidebar to say, yeah, thank you. All right, uh, the limiting factor in the lifespan of a grass house um, is probably not the thatch. Um, it's, it's, it's the poles. But, uh, in, in Europe, thatch roofs made from, from Phragmites, from, from this common reed, they typically last 25 to 40 years and up to 80 years. Now you are re-roofing the, re the very top of the roof um, over that period. Um, but, and shorter grasses like wheat straw are only gonna last 15 to 25 years. So, but in these houses, yeah, decay is happening at the soil line where you have a lot of, of organic activity going on. Uh, and that's where, where the, so the posts are particularly susceptible. Um, Carolyn Good used fence post data and she thinks 15, she had calculated 15, 10 to 15 years would be about the lifespan um, for houses at the DeShazo site in East Texas. Um, again, Scooter Cheetah's 1981 house didn't have anyone living in it and maintaining it there. At the, it was a demo house at, at the Caddo Mounds, um, but it did last 14 years before they finally burned it down um, in, in 1995. So, mm. Oh, I don't know that we have much in the way of archaeological evidence or historic accounts for what the lashing was that, that you used to tie the willow laths onto the pine poles. Um, but uh, Espinosa describes them as, quote, made from the bark of the tree and so strong they cannot be broken between the hands, however thin they may be. And paleoethnobotanist Elizabeth Horton suggests that the inner bark of hickory would be that material, maybe that material. Um, it's tough, it tightens as, it's dry, as it dries, and according to Liz, it's almost impossible to dislodge once it has dried. Um, and, all, and in Henri Joutel's account, Caddo's taught him how to use hickory bark to make straps for the French horses when he was visiting in the 1680s. Um, the, the dogs kept eating the leather straps for the horses, and he, <laughs> so he, he needed to do something. Uh, so, so again, hickory, hickory bark, the inner, sorry, the inner bark of hickory, you're looking at the outer bark, there's there's inner, inner bark that, is, that, that can be, when, when it's fresh, of course, is, is, is wet and pliable and, and easy, easy, easily made into, into strips. Um, the 1981 Caddo house that built at Caddo Mounds used um, rawhide, leather, and grapevine uh, for, for, to tie their laughing onto the, onto the support poles, and commercial jute string was used in, in 2016. So. There is quite a bit of cane associated with cattle cat sites, whether it's whether burnt houses or general trash pits. And it speaks to the importance of cane as a material for arrow shafts, baskets, mats, blow tubes, feather holders, all kinds of all kinds of other uh, of other materials. Uh, when burnt cane is found with burnt structures, I think it's most likely from interior uh, interior shelving or or interior basketry or mats that or interior dividers that were used. Morphe mentions long twigs used for the horizontal supports. I don't, I don't think cane was used for the horizontal supports. I think willows, willows much more likely. Um, Morphe mentions long twigs for horizontal supports and that would be an odd way to describe cane. Uh, and I think willow, willow seems a likely choice. Again, it's what was used in the 2016 house. Uh, willow is also used in the horizontal model on the rectangular house at winding stair. Um, Early, sorry, I, I suspect it's willow. It was made from split branches, so it's definitely not cane, and I think willow is probably what's going on there too. Uh, 
I will close by, by noting that a house doesn't stop at the walls, um, either, either in the activities of the house or in the connections of the people, uh, the connections to other people and to other places. Um, houses, caddo houses, place the householders in relation to other families and to the political and religious hierarchy. The activity of construction expresses the reciprocity of building and feasting between community members. And it also underscores the authority of the caddy and the political hierarchy in planning and decision-making for the community. The architectural style is shared by everybody, but it still has the flexibility to mark distinctions through the size and the location of the structure. Construction activity drew people from all over the social landscape, um, just as the plant materials come from all over the physical landscape. Poles from the upland forests, grasses from the prairie openings, willow from the riverbanks, cane and reeds from the wetlands. Um, I do plan to come from Austin to help with the construction of the new house in 2022. And I hope and expect that that house will, will work as houses have worked on the, on the landscape uh, in East Texas for a thousand years. Um, it starts with a consultation of leaders, the appointment of supervisors, and in this case, there will be five or six Caddo, Caddo interns who will be learning who will be learning this um, this tradition and how to and, and how to perpetuate it. And it will bring people, I hope, all over from all over to eat and work and tell stories. So y'all come. Thanks. Um, you can hang on to that. So we're probably going to have some questions here. Uh, here in the room, Fred. On the modern construction or reconstruction, is there any preference as to pine species for the support poles like long, long leaf or, or long lolly or just not even make a difference to one or two? I don't know. It's they're provided by the Stephen F. Austin, the forestry, the, the US, sorry, the USDA forestry um, project. I, if anybody is on the Zoom, if Elder Cross is on the Zoom call, I would sure love to, to hear from him. Maybe we can repeat the question so that folks oh, on Zoom can hear. The question is whether those species of pine makes a difference. Um, and I should say, archaeologically, if I found if I found pine remains, I would not be able to tell species within the, the general timber group, southern yellow pine. So uh, my impression is probably not, but it might. And and if anybody's on the Zoom who would know, I'd love to hear. Yeah. yeah, has there been any attention or are you aware of that um, trying to uh, connect geography and chronology to try to see the spread of the architectural style types from one region to another? Oh, Tim's asking about, about spread and spread of this architectural style because it's shared by Caddo's and, and their, their reasonably close relatives, Wichita's. I don't know. Um, there is a lovely book by Nabokov, Na Native American Architecture, where he, he lays out arch typical architectural styles from all kind different regions of the United States, but I don't think he discusses influences um, on, on the architecture. Interesting. Somebody, somebody should do that. <laughs> Second doctor. Sir. Um, so seeing as how they it's a house made out of grass and sticks, um, mm -hmm. how do they fare with extreme weather? How does the house fare with extreme weather? Well, it depends on how extreme I think. A category, it was a very powerful tornado that, that took the house. Um, prior to that, this, this very house sustained high winds and it sort of had a little sway in it on the upper left. So, um, so it, it did very well. And uh, according to accounts of people, the people who, who were in the grass house at the time of the shaho of the, the uh, tornado. It lasted a long time. It picked up the whole house. Mm -hmm. um, which, oh, by the way, I was, pardon? Yeah, yes. 
I was privileged to work on this house next to an art professor from the University of Victoria who, who pointed out that this is technically a very large basket. Oh, and, they're, and they're for a textile, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions in the room at the moment? Would you spell, you keep talking about laughing. How do you spell oh, L A T H. L A T H. There might be an E on the end. Laughing. Laugh. 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 Oh, thank you. That's no, I just, my dad was talking about laughing. the lady. The lady, yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. No, I have, I have <laughs> talked this talk before. And then we got one more in the room, and then we're going to go to Zoom here. Skipper? Uh, I was living in Kettledown early 1980s. My wife opened the park. And we were there when a store hit the first house, and that was in 1984. And it actually broke it. It pushed it down and twisted it to one side. And it stayed like that for many years. But it was probably down there. It was a really bad thunderstorm, and it did break it. So yes, thank you for thank you for sharing that, that damage to the first house, but it did stay standing for yeah. again fourteen years. It did stay. <clears throat> it kind of kept leaning one way or the other. The last time I saw it, it was in my house. So. <laughs> So for the folks on Zoom, Skipper was sharing his, his experience at Caddo Mounds uh, when his wife opened the park in uh, the early 1980s, and a storm hit the original grass house in 1984, 1984 or 5, and it damaged that house, but it continued to stand for a long time. Um, all right, folks on Zoom, any questions? Um, are we monitoring chat here? Yes. Uh, I'm gonna... I have to turn my mic off again because it echoes. Here's a question. What does recovered saw from cattle sites tell us about plant materials used in construction techniques? What does dog tell oh what does dog tell us about recovered from the sites tell us about construction techniques? A lot of the impressions of in the dog are cane. So it tells us, tells us a lot about, oh, I should say they're reported as cane. I have not gone back to look, and I don't know, often it's not clear who has made those identifications and if excavators are simply assuming that it was cane because there are a lot of large stemmed grasses in the world, big blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass, Eastern gamma, um, that can have culms of similar size to cane. So um, I will say that, that most, of, most of the material are reported as being cane. Um, and sometimes, oh, and sometimes people will call Phragmites, uh, Phragmites australis, the common reed. Um, I have seen in the literature that described as, given the common name for that given is cane. So there does seem to be some kind of tendency for large grasses just to be called cane, we don't know. Um, which is kind of mostly my answer. We don't really know. Um, but, but the extent of the daub is, is interesting. Excavators have not generally thought that, that, daub, that the daub, uh, that the bottoms of the houses were covered in daub, although that is a, it's been mentioned as a possibility in some maps like the Turan map, it, there's a sort of line, horizontal line going across the houses as though some of these, as though some of them may have been um, wattle and daub at the bottom and then thatching only begins at shoulder height or so. Not clear if that's a Spanish interpretation um, when that art was made or if that's, if that's a possibility. Uh, for the architecture, but my impression is that there's that that the uh, daub tends to be more associated with the rectangular houses, and, and that's that's the way it is in the Mississippian or in the Middle Mississippian world where these rectangular houses are more common. Yeah. Interesting question. All right, next question: um, What activities took place inside domiciles as opposed to extra extramural activities at a suburb? Extramural meaning oh. oh. Could, ever, could everybody hear that or do I need to repeat this? Uh, on Zoom, they should be able to see that cool. in the chat. Ah, love it. Okay. Um, interior to the house, we've got a lot of processing, plant processing going on in bad weather. Since, since the plants are my thing, that's the one that I have paid most attention to. Um, but certainly a lot of, of sleeping, tending, to, uh, uh, 
sleeping, tending to the sick, tending to um, tending to uh, tending to babies and things like that. Um, these wouldn't have been terribly brightly lit. Oh, I didn't say that. There's only one entryway in these houses. And often it's very difficult for archaeologists to figure out from the pattern of circular posts where the opening is. Uh, the 2022 grass house at Caddo Mounds will have two, will have two doors to be ADA compliant. So, uh, yeah. so, but, 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 but you're receive, receive, dancing, receiving of guests and so on. Uh, Henri Jutel, I believe, was housed in, so in a regular it's a chief's house, but still a, a sort of a regular house. Um, but, but, but gatherings for war parties and things may have been in other types of, of buildings. And one more, uh, structures on the mound at the Hatchell site had either bodark or cypress wood. What does that tell us about the character of the Ooh. houses on the mound? And it's a Hatchell site, which is up in Bowie County. Somebody tell me where the, where the Hatchell site is. I don't know. All right. Um, about Bodark, I'm going to say that I've been working on sites, looking at plant remains from sites in the Bodark Creek um, Reservoir and uh, archaeology done in, in anticipation of that reservoir. And there is more Bodark per sample, per any, per any measure than any other place I have ever looked at. Um, so, but Hatchell site, I think, is, is Moody County up on the, on the Red River. Yes, it's on the Red River. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so what does that tell us? Uh, it tells us that they're using wood from near water, uh, the cypress and, and presumably the bodark. Um, I'd have to, I'd be interested to know more about, is, about what the, uh, and cypress is also pretty decay resistant. Actually, both those are really decay resistant. So, so that maybe is the most important thing is that they want that, whatever that structure is to last a really long time. I think that's, that's probably what ties those together. Maybe the symbology of the water, but probably the decay. What do you think? It looked like somebody had their hand up, so maybe they want to ask it. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, do we have a question from the floor and Zoom? Yes, yeah, Jimmy. Go ahead, Dr. Lentz. Question I have relates to the grass structures. In the houses I've dealt with uh, over my career, I've seen about a half a dozen that have had something, an, uh, an artifact called a silica froth. And these are uh, bubbly kind of things, green to black, uh, usually about the size of marble, kind of irregular, but they're not spherical often, but they can be bubbly. And the thought has always been that these may be melted uh, uh, phytolith, opal phytolith from grass. Uh, most of the ones I've seen them come from houses in eastern Oklahoma, but I do have one or two in the, in the panhandle that have that substance. Have you given any thought to uh, the implications of silica froth in, in these uh, sites where they're intentionally burned? Is there a difference in the types of grass that would produce differential amounts of silica froth? Uh, I've actually taken a bison dung and tried cooking them in, in pottery kilns to try to generate silica froth and have been unsuccessful at this so far, but. Uh, there are East Texas Caddo sites known with silica froth. Yes. Experimental archeology span is in order, um, especially with, with cane. Um, and what, what, what makes silica froth? Does it have to be green? I, I would wonder if the grass needed to be the grass in question needed to be green versus dried. Um, and in the panhandle, we might look at uh, the raphides that are in yucca might be what's producing silica froth. Um, of course, there's a lot of grasses out there as well. But yeah, interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Anything else on Zoom right now? Just okay. compliments on the presentation, the wonderful presentation, yeah, fantastic, and all that. All right. Well, last last round. Any other questions on the floor here in the room? I've got a question about the bodar. It's dry. It's so stiff. Green. It's more breathable. Mm -hmm. They could have used it for structure. Yeah, they could have, but the, it's in the mulberry family. You know, mulberry trees just kind of grow twisty and gnarled, which isn't to say that if a very determined person would prune it, which, which is 
there's a whole tradition of, of pruning um, Scunthorpe sumac to make beautiful long branches for basketry, and that's another plant that grows over the gnarled leaves. Um, but bow darks are just so long lived, they're slower growing. I wouldn't wouldn't think that people would have, would have trained them to do that, um, but certainly for, for other purposes, they are. And on, we do a whole program on, on Zoom, that question was about Bodark oh. being dried and it's not flexible and green, it's very flexible and possibly using that for the, the house construction. And, and even dry Bodark, of course, it's, it's the bow wood, so it's, it's still pretty darn flexible. All right, and on Zoom, any final questions? Okay. More questions, just compliments. All right. Well, then thank you, everybody. Um, we'll conclude our May meeting. Uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, time and joining us. And, and Dr. Bush's reminder here about July 5th to 17th, I appreciate that. We do have that in the May newsletter. So look at the NTAS May newsletter for detail. If you want to participate in the uh, grass house rebuilding at the Caddo Mound State Historic Site, we have the details in this month's newsletter. So with that. Um, if anybody wants these, it's the TAS wrap cards to give away if you're doing anything. Wesley, I think you, somebody wanted some of these at our right. last meeting. Katrina's got TAS wrap cards if anybody wants them. But otherwise, good night, everybody. We'll see y'all in July. Yeah.